Thank you. Um, I'm going to start that thing. Well, first I want to thank uh, Richard and all the officer guys for getting us here. To, I don't know why, but coming to Dublin makes me happy anytime, you know. <laughs> I go all around the world like that, you know. Coming to Ireland, wow, that's great, <laughs> you know. Len and I were very happy to be here. And very happy to be at Offset, at this incredible you know, conference with a lot of uh, very alive kind of things. And it confirms to me that there is room really for everybody in the world, for some perhaps a little more, and uh, for some a little less perhaps. <laughs> but anyhow, we, we, we enjoyed everything so far. You know. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have the feeling that after all the amusing things we have seen, um, this looks like a history lecture. Um, as a matter of fact, it's almost a history lecture. Let's see. Uh, uh, well, can, can you hear my accent? Can you, can you understand from my accent? <laughs> Great, you're lucky because I can on the other way around. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your generosity on the subject. <laughs> So I would say that I, uh, before even I start, I think it's a good idea to give you the key for understanding better our work and the way we've been working for so long. I see graphic design as the organization of information that is semantically correct. That to me is very important. Semantically correct means to look for the roots of what you're doing, not just doing like this. And then, of course, once you start to do something, it should be synthetically consistent. That means that every detail along should be coherent. And then, of course, what you do uh, it could be the most beautiful thing in the world, but if the people do not get it, you know, uh, it's almost like having wasted your time. So to be pragmatically understandable is very important. And I like to be visually powerful. I don't like limpy design. Uh, intellectually elegant, I don't mean by more as elegant, but in mind, and above all, uh, timeless. You know, I can't stand, you know, thing. I can't stand trends and fashions, which are good in certain areas, but in the design areas, they show a level of ir irresponsibility that I think it should be avoided uh, to a certain extent. So, uh, you won't believe it, but we're going to start from 1955. That is more than a half a century ago. Most of these people, you were not even, not only born, you were not even on the idea of getting born. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say what you were in the <laughs> not that is a, it's a long time ago. Um, so when I was a student of architecture in Venice, I was supporting myself somehow by working at Venini uh, factory. Venini was a glass, fabulous glass maker in the, in the island of Murano. And he gave me the assignment of designing a whole series of uh, lighting fixtures. So um, what it turns out that I was lucky uh, to start very young to be interested in design. I, was, I started about when I was 14. And when I was 16, I went to work in the office of the Castiglioni brothers, who were very good architects in, in Milan. And they were working on the whole field of design. They were working on architecture, naturally, you know, interiors, furniture, exhibitions, product design, you name it, everything. They were designing radios, they were designing flatware, silverware, chinaware, glassware, everything, you know. And I say, wow, this is really interesting, you know, th that an architect can do everything. As a matter of fact, you know, it was Lowe's, the Viennese architect, that said that an architect should be able to design everything from the spoon to the city. And I follow, I design a lot of spoons, but not a city yet. But, uh, you know, still young. So it might happen. <laughs> it might still happen. And uh, so when I had to design the lighting fixture, of course, I, I wanted to do the, the, I did the white part where the light goes, o goes out, and then the decorative part at the bottom. This notion of decoration has always been obsessing, uh, and 
you know, to me, to my mind, this, uh, this contrast between function and decoration, and uh, how one could, how the two things can live together. And, uh, and so throughout our life, we have been struggling with this issue, particularly because our way of working is, uh, our method of working is subtractive. So instead of, of adding, we like to take things out and keep taking things out until you get to the essence of things. So um, the, one of the other lamps I was doing at the time was, uh, was this lamp, where the, the, the lampshade and the bottom were becoming all one thing. Previously, they were always separate things, you know. So it was it was quite a <laughs> quite an advanced idea at the time, and then it became normal. Uh, this one of the things that I like in life is to design things that then become part of the language. I'm not so much interested in designing art or masterpieces. I'm very much interested to develop a language that can be followed by other people in, with, in a comfortable manner. Uh, more glasses. And this is the, the day of our uh, wedding, uh, our marriage, our wedding, actually. And uh, we married, and then we, we came to the United States with a, with a, with a fellowship. The guy pushing us out is Paolo Venini. And uh, Lyle and I, we have been working together ever uh, since that day, basically. And uh, we've been collaborating. And you know, collaboration, it might be interesting to, to describe, it's not really that we hand the pencil with, you know, with four hands, you know, with all our hands but is to share a cultural platform. That is what collaboration is all about. So that you discuss things, and there are things, I might be the guy with the pencil on his hands, but if Leila says, um, it's the wrong direction, I just take that thing and I throw it in the waste basket, because I trust their judgment, and, and that is the way we work together. Sometimes I do things by myself, particularly in the graphic side, but when it comes to products or interiors, uh, very often we work together. Sometimes Leila works by herself in, on, the, on the interior side. Sometimes we do it together. Sometimes I do interior by myself. You know, so it is that kind of a thing. But we discuss everything. We don't agree all the time, but basically we share that platform. So having said that, you know, we, came to, we came to the States, and I came with a fellowship uh, or I went actually from here with a fellowship on, um, by a glass, by a silver company. And since I had a glass experience, I tried to put together uh, glass and silver. So these people uh, went around and they did what they call it a market research. And they come back and they say, Massimo, you know, uh, we search, we did focus groups and uh, those things don't sell. Well, I said, it's just too bad. It's okay. Uh, too bad. When I, I went back to Italy, and, they, and I offered that to Venini and Cristofolo, and they've been selling for 20 years. <laughs> you know, but they never made a mark of research. So the point is, <laughs> the point is, it really made me to understand, that is the moment when I start to understand that, uh, the way they do market research in America is not the right way. You don't have to ask people what they want. You have to ask people what they need. That's what you have to find out with research. Because if, they ask, if you ask what they want, they don't know what they want yet. Let me get a drink and I get. A friend of mine um, that then <coughs> used to be the design director of Philips. And uh, he said, you know, the, the difference between designers and marketing people is that designers look through the windshield, marketing people look to the rear mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very, very well put. They look always to the past. What the, what the focus group could know, could know nothing. You know, they could know only what they've seen before. 
But designers, they're always looking forward. They have imagination, they have vision, they have knowledge, and they do things in a responsible way. This is why design is such a great profession. And marketing <laughs> is a lousy profession. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see you share that. <laughs> it is allowed. <laughs> it is really been invented to protect your back. You know, is the a profession that is based on fear of failure. How could it be looking forward? Why how could it be a, a profession with vision if they are dominated by failure? They can't. You know, so one up for design. <laughs> <laughs> And went back up. You see, this has a magic button that goes by itself. Well, I start again. OK, good. Um, I went back. We went after the American experience of the three years, one in Boston and two in Chicago, where I was teaching at the Institute of Design there and learning uh, more things. We went back to Milano and set up our own office. And uh, we were in Milano from 60 to 65. And at that time, during those years, I began, of course, I was working in the whole field of design, and I began to discover that I had a language of my own. And, uh, you know, usually when I write, I, I have a line between one argument and another one, one subject and another, and that became very natural even in designing these kind of things. Also, for me, um, well, of course, you know, I will have a chance to talk later about type, so I don't mention now. But, um, you know, for, for several years before the type uh, Helvetica came about, we were cutting letters, you know, to get less kerning, less space between letters, you know. We lost a lot of them, but, uh, you know, cutting and putting it together. Finally, the greatest thing that happened was that Helvetica had no shoulder, so we didn't have to cut <laughs> the letters, and we could use it. So everything, f since that day, we've been using Helvetica in a, in a, in a great quantity, of course. And, uh, you know, we think also uh, the type is related to legibility. On the poster, you know, there are uh, three moments, uh, one from far away, so a large size type, then a medium-sized type, and then small type when you get close, you know. Um, we don't think that type should be related to a volume, you know, like in a radio, that you, you raise the volume and you lower the volume. It has nothing to do with, with that. Um, it has to do more with sight and functions, you know. Of course, you can also introduce emotional points and emotional elements, and that is very important. You can do that, you know, but, um, but one has to be a little more control. Uh, poster for the Biennale in Venice, uh, you know, light is the only thing that all the arts have in common, so there is no color with the exception of the red and green because it happens to be in Venice. Um, book, uh, book covers, you know, um, it's a long story, so I'm trying to, in a short time, to. Uh, to condense, to condense, you know, uh, the, you know, in, in Europe we tend to do series of books because one book supports the other one to a certain extent. So these books, they all have the same graphic approach and uh, the difference between one cover and the other is given by the amount of text and so you can distinguish that. But these are paperbacks or small books, but by putting the type that on the, on the side, you can get much more uh, legibility from a distance, so therefore much more display value, so to speak. You know? <coughs> and, uh, and fine. Also, the, the other good thing, you don't have to invent a cover all the time. Um, I had a client that was making uh, Mickey Mouse ashtrays, really, with Mickey Mouse and Goofy, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, why don't you, since you make things with melamine, why don't we make a set of dishes that is very stackable, you know, and uh, very compact, and we can, we can get the designer word, and, you know, really, we'll, we'll have. And it's exactly what happened. We made these 
place, they got the uh, Golden Compass Award back in 1964, and, uh, and they went in every museum. The company went bankrupt, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't go bankrupt because of these dishes, actually. But the, it just so happened, it's the history of design. Um, what happens is the, the company was then bought by an American company, and they, these plates have been made for the last, you know, 40, 50 years, 40 years in, in the States, and everybody grew up in the States with this kind of place. And um, then we have a motto in, the, in, in our family as well as in our office that says, if you can find it, design it. So it happens that we uh, needed to have a sofa and we couldn't find anything that we like. And uh, one day a manufacturer came to see us and, and he says, I would like you to design some sofa. And I said, we are ready. <laughs> we, know what, <laughs> we, we know what we want. You know, and so we designed this sofa, very thick, you know, a sofa that becomes like a wall because we cannot stand furniture against the wall. Now, you know, to say it is ridiculous. Everybody puts furniture in the middle of the room nowadays. But, you know, in the last century, <laughs> as a matter of fact, all the furniture were scattered around the walls, you know, splattered around the walls by, by God knows what kind of force, you know. And we like it. <laughs> <coughs> and we like it to have it in the center, you know, so that it creates a space. Again, you know, timelessness, of course, these are still in production. Now, you name me, uh, you know, furniture that is still in production after 60 years. Um, another one, a table where you put all the chairs under, it becomes a big, you know, solid cubes. And then in, in the 65, we started a company with a, with a couple of friends, a few friends. Uh, the company was called Unimark International, and it was done uh, you know, based in Chicago, and, and uh, we started with an office in Chicago, Milano, New York. And in Milano, I, I joined with Bob Norda, and, uh, and we started. Then after a while, I went to the United States, after, because, you know, I was going back and forth from Milano to the United States, um, you know, every month, and so I got tired. Um, that, that is me, believe it or not. <laughs> I must tell you that my grandchildren don't recognize me there, <laughs> you know. Anyhow, uh, it's me with a white smoke. Now, why the white smoke? Because in Europe, you know, every trade uh, has its own uh, smoke, you know. Uh, doctors, for instance, and, you know, dentists and so on, they have a white smoke. And uh, as you know, at that time, uh, design was a, a rather young profession. So um, it wasn't very, very common. People did not have that much trust into it. And so we, you know, when, when people were coming at our, at our office, um, we, they would see all these people with a white mark, you know, like a hospital, <laughs> like a dentist. Immediately they get much more, you know, respect. <laughs> <laughs> And it's funny because it really works. I remember that um, we were bidding for the corporate identity of Ford, for the cars company. And, uh, and so they went around to see the office. They went around to, to New York, to Chicago office and New York office. New York office at the time was a small office, about 2,000 square feet. And uh, we had about, you know, half a dozen people. But when we knew that uh, these guys from Ford were coming to visit the office, we, call all the, we told the people there to call all their friends, and we put white mark on them. <laughs> and everybody was doing something, cutting paper, doing line, <laughs> getting back and forth. So when the Ford people came in, they said, geez, that office is big. <laughs> it's very crowded. They're all working. <laughs> Well, you have to do things like that, you know. At the beginning of your career, you have to resort to anything. 19 <laughs> 1966, we designed, we had this incredible assignment of designing the, the signage for the New York subway. 
uh, New York subway is great the way it works, you know, but there are 475 stations and there was the, the result from the merging of the independent uh, lines. So it, it was a mess, it's still a mess, you know, from a point of view. And so we designed a system where you have a bar, you know, a tube, where you can hook modular elements, four feet, one foot, two feet, you know, and eight feet, and so that you can pre, um, prefabric, prefab these things, you know, and uh, speed up the entire process. Uh, it, was, it was done <laughs> in a funny way, anyhow. Uh, but it's amazing that the, regardless of the changes, the, the, the funny application and implementation that I've done, the system still hold regardless of all kind of violence that they got, you know. And it's still there when you go to New York, you more or less, you see that. Um, we, we got at the time also the, the assignment to design things for null, and we were doing the New York office, and this is a poster we did at the time for the fur furniture company, great furniture company. And we designed for 15 years all the graphics for null, you know, brochures and catalogs and price list and stationery and uh, showrooms and exhibitions, the whole thing, you know, it was fun. Uh, by the same time, also, we, we, we got the assignment of designing American Airlines, and, uh, and so we did a, a logo in Helvetica, <laughs> for the fun of it, not American <laughs> type, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so we did one word, American Airlines, instead of two words, and uh, half red and half blue. What could be more American than that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we didn't have to go that far. But again, there were no logos at the time that I know. There were one word, two colors, you know. And of course, that became very, very popular, but that's okay, fine. That's, the, that's our function in, in the field. And, uh, and then this is the company that, that bought the plastic dishes that you have seen before, and the name is Heller. And so we decided to, to do packaging for all the different products, but keeping the name always the same size. So if the box is big, you get Heller, and if the box is small, you get Hell. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's smaller, you can just get H. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, um, I, I mentioned about timelessness, and if there is one thing that I never like in design, is to reduce graphic design to misery. For me to design, you know, reduce graphic design to misery is to have the kind of layout where you have one picture here, one picture there, one picture there, one picture here, one is bleeding, one is gone out, one is a margin, one doesn't, and so on and so forth, you know. And even worse, if it's done with artistry, you know, which, which that word should be penalized, and, uh, you know, and so that you look at the layout instead of reading the content, you know. So we like instead of the kind of approach where you have just very simple. You have a full page, full spreads, and you keep going. There's nothing can go wrong. This was done, you know, 40, 50, 40 years ago probably, and it's still fine. I'm still doing pages like this, you know, books with a you know, full spread and full page. And uh, it's the sequence that is important. It's the cropping that you give to the picture. It's the scale. Scale is very important, by the way, not size. But we'll have another example that can show that you know, scale is intangible. And size is measurable. It's tangible. And it's very tricky. But it's great when you understand to work with those two elements. I need some water. <coughs> In 1972, we designed a map for the, for the New York subway. And it's a, you know, based like the London map on a grid of 90 and 45 degrees. In London, they're civilized and it's still like that. In New York, they're different. <laughs> so the map lasts from 72 to 79. In 79, they changed the nomenclature of the lines and so the map was obsolete. It's too bad because it was a very nice looking map and, and a very good one too. 
but <clears throat> last year we have redesigned it and I will show it later. Uh, more things for Knoll. We find out that there was a uh, just fresh from Europe in, in America. There was a, a new machine that can print newspapers in uh, four color, four color press. And so we stopped doing the brochure for Knoll in offset or a, you know, a similar device. And we start to do it like a newspaper in, a, in color and just a newspaper print. It was an exciting thing to get away from, from the usual kind of brochures. Now, um, say, say 1971, we left Unimark. And, oh, by the way, um, there is a book that is just coming out. It's called Unimark. And I highly suggest you to read it because it's an extremely interesting book. In a, it tells the whole story of Unimark, the company that we started, as I say, in 1965 with an office in Chicago, one in Milan, one in New York, and then we opened one in Denver, one in Detroit, one in, in San Francisco, uh, more, uh, one in, um, I, what's the name, uh, London, and uh, in Copenhagen, <laughs> and Melbourne, and Johannesburg. You know, so all around the world. In a, in a, in, you know, in, in the course of a few years, it became the largest design company in the world. And uh, as well as it went up, it went down. <laughs> <You know. coughs> in 1971, we, I left the, the company. I was the design director of the company. And so a lot of designers left the company too because the, all, of, all of a sudden the marketing people were beginning to take over the thing and the company was changing its character. And after a while, sure enough, the, the company went bankrupt and, uh, and it went out of business. But the book is in extremely interesting for every designer to read, to see how a company can, can go up, what, what's the drive, and at the same time, what, which were the pitfalls you know, that sunk the company. It's a good instructive kind of book in that respect. Um, when we started uh, the, the office, uh, this, this is the two of us, Lel and I, when we got, uh, you know, we were working on a museum uh, for Minneapolis and on an exhibition for Noel at the Louvre in Paris. And then we started to design newspaper design. It's all done. Newspaper design were done previously with just columns. Columns is not a grid, it's, it's a silly thing. Uh, we introduced the notion of a grid on newspaper where every element becomes modular. So this is two modules, two modules, two, this is one module. It's one module and so on and so forth. So y you could speed up the entire preparation of the newspaper by, uh, by making a modular uh, structure. <coughs> this is another uh, newspaper with the same kind of uh, approach, different details, but basic concept. And then in 1972, we designed the old corporate identity for Bloomingdale. Bloomingdale is a department store in New York, very alive, you know, probably the best in town. And uh, so we wanted to portray the liveliness by not having one kind of a, a package, but by having all kinds of colors, you know, and so on. It's a long story, but I cut it short, you know, but it's uh, still around. And uh, nothing's been changed for the last 32 years. You know, it's amazing. Uh, we've done a lot of department store graphics, you know, in our life, like J.C. Penney and, you know, well, thing, you know, American companies, anyhow. And, uh, and it's amazing. They all, they, all, they all change after a while. There was never a need to change from, for Bloomingdale. The, the, the type is very, very easy type. <laughs> you can see it there, very modernist but it's still, still, uh, still around. Uh, it's a, a credenza designed by Leila. And these are the Vignellis in the 70s. Look, how <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. Look at my pants. <laughs> Look at my hair. <laughs> Leila looks great. <laughs> 
You know, I thought that it was important to see what did we look like when we were doing that, those kind of things. You know, it's part of history, you know, in a sense. I was doing this kind of cups at the time. Beautiful cup, you know, where the, done in with a, you know, with plastic. And it's important when you work with plastic to keep the thickness consistent throughout, you know. So if you look in plan, you know, you have the circle and then you have the, the, the handles there that comes out like this, you know. And, uh, and I didn't realize really when I was doing the drawing after all that this, this is where you put your thumb, you know, and it was open. And that's okay, we made it and I like that, it makes a lot of sense. But <laughs> I didn't take in consideration the fact that I was in America and America is full of Americans. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and the Americans, they're used to compulsive consumption. So they don't drink demitas like we do in a civilized country like in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> they fill up all the thing, all the way to the brim, <laughs> you know. So the coffee will go up here, and then find a nice hole. <laughs> <laughs> You find a nice gutter there, go on the, on the saucer, this natural is very flat design-wise, you know, zoom, like this, and then it, So it goes on the tablecloth, and what happens? They write a letter, they say, we're gonna sue you, the company, you know, <laughs> that's what they do. Then it never comes to their, their mind that they could put less coffee, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when you have an empire, you don't think of thinking like that. <laughs> you, know, you are the owner of the world, you know, you need a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so Leila that is very pragmatic, of course, you know, she designed these bakeware things and, they, and memory, memory, with the memory of all the time she got uh, scalded on the, on the oven, she decided to put a handle all around. And so you have that handle that goes all around, and there's a beautiful made of glass, bakeware stuff, and the, the, ed, the, the surface here is grooved so you, you don't see the food. You know, funny enough, food is great in plan. You always photograph the food in plan. But in section, forget it. <laughs> so it was good not to see that. Uh, one of the greatest things about designing uh, products is that you play with light. And uh, particularly if you design with, with um, silver, you know, and you groove the silver, or same or with glass, or same with any kind of material, basically, if you groove, you trap the light in, you know, to the surface. And if you polish that, you reflect the light. And so that's all there is in designing, really. Trapping the light and reflecting the light, making an edge sharp or round, which indeed makes the light to act in a different way. And that is what is the beauty of design. You see, it's not to follow um, fashions, it's just to play with light. Uh, Lella plays with light <laughs> and silver. This is a whole bunch of, of rings that she has designed. She loves to design jewelry. And, um, and in the shape of numbers, you see six, eight, five, one, three, and so on. So you put your rings on, and then you can flash your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> see, girls? <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a necklace done with tubes, you know, and they chop the tube like salami, ta 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 ta, in, or cubes. And it looks terrific because all the reflections they start to, to, to come into action, you know, and so on. This is a museum that we did in, in uh, Minneapolis. And again, in museum, we like to have the object to be the protagonist, you know. So it's not the, the display case. We, very often when you go to museum, the display case particularly if it's designed by some modern architects, <laughs> you know, you, you see the display case, but you don't see the object. So we, we made the display cases to disappear almost, and so you have just the object, you know, displayed most of the time. 
<coughs> um, calendars are a, another of my passion to design. I like to design calendars with big numbers. <laughs> this calendar is about the size you see it over here. It's, f it's four feet by three feet. It's big like this. And so you can see the date across the room. And it's been very popular. Designed in 1966. It's still in the market every year. Look, you, you figure out how many years. It's still, you know, all around the world, they, they're buying it. But this is great because it tells you what day it is, you know. This calendar here is beautiful because it has big number, but you have to tell the calendar what day it is. That's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> Should be the other way around. Um, let me see, what do I do? Um, oh, these are the Vignellis, again, becoming a little more affluent. You can see, you know, with a Liechtenstein thing on the back. And, and at the time, we designed a church. It's always good, you never know. And to, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, I'm Italian, I know it. <laughs> and uh, so we designed the church, and uh, like the New England churches, they have these beautiful pews, and everything moves in this church because they, they do dance, they do conference, they do concerts, they do church functions and wedding, funerals, the whole thing. So it's a very, very active kind of thing in New York, of course, in the city court building. And they also do baptistry, uh, bat, uh, what do you say, when they, but, but, yeah, you got it. <laughs> it's good to talk in a Catholic country, they know it. <laughs> you know? So you can, you can have a by immersion, you know, just in case, uh, symbolize the Jordan River. Or you can have it over the counter if you're in a rush, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is movable. The pulpit is movi movable, the altar is movable, the, 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 the organ is not movable, but it's over there, we designed that too, you know, the whole thing. And also we designed naturally all the implements. You know, this is for the um, holy wafers. Yes, no, yeah, one or the other. You know, and, uh, and not two, you know. And, uh, you know, they put these things there. This is what I like, you know, that, that boom, boom, boom. <laughs> that thing that goes back and forth. Well, okay, uh, this is a trade show. You know, it's amazing that Sometimes we are so much ahead of technologies, this is incredible. You know, I designed this exhibit for a BMW and uh, with those big backlit walls, but there was no technology available at the time like it is today. You sit on a computer and this machine prints, you know, any size you want. At that time, you had to do photostats and, and and sales screen, very complicated kind of operation. But eventually, you know, and we still do uh, backlit walls. You know. This was a long time ago. Uh, a department store is a, is, a, is a place that needs to be changed all the time. So we put everything on wheels. We put little boutiques on the side that can be extended. And all these elements, they are movable, and you can continuously create a different environment. Uh, most of the time, they build like a house, like a temple, and that, then they have to destroy the whole thing and build again. Silly operation. It should be done flexible like this, and it was done in a whole series of department store in California that we did at the time, Magnin. Here you see a picture of that uh, it's a bad picture, but <laughs> the, the thing shows the flexibility of the place. Uh, in 1976, um, let me get some water. Was the 200th anniversary of the United States. So they commissioned to me to design a poster for, um, on the subject of the melting pot. Now, if there is one thing I don't like is the notion of melting pot. You don't go to America to melt, you know. <laughs> you go to America to interact finally with people coming from everywhere else in the world. And that is what makes America great, you know, is the fact that in New York, you walk on the street, nobody speaks the same language, you know. 
everybody comes from somewhere, somewhere else, and you see this is this continuous interaction between different cultures that makes that place as great as it is. You know, it's a fabulous place because of that. You know, when I go to Italy, Italy is a beautiful place too. You know, great looking country. But you know what? There are too many Italians. <laughs> I mean, everybody speaks Italian. It's not that boring. <laughs> you, know? you know, there is not enough interaction. There's not enough excitement. You know, so I went downstairs and to the to the newsstands, and I bought newspaper, bought in, I mean, published in New York in the same day, and I made a flag like this. I sent sent that flag to Washington. Uh, they like it. But one of the generals, you know, the generals have that kind of mind, you know, they start to read all the news and they didn't like the news. And so he said, well, we liked it, but I think he said that then, let's ask the designer he said, to, if he can do it, the artist actually said, let's ask the artist if he can do it with better news. <laughs> can you imagine just me doing that? One day told me, he says, listen, I didn't go to choose the bad day. I mean, it's one day in the history of the United States. It happened to be like that, you know, it's just too bad. But uh, I cannot redo it again because I find better news. But so they never did it, and then it was uh, printed separately. Uh, what instead was done was the program for the national parks, for all the printed matter of the national parks. <coughs> It's a huge program, probably the largest program ever done. And they wanted to have a good identification, and so we, we, we got this black bar throughout. We got all the way, you know, a modular structure for the whole thing. We designed grids and so on and so forth. We, you know, again, you can see modulation, like I said before, you know, for headlines, for text, and for pictures, and so on and so forth. And then for the books as well, you know, very simple layout so that it will last a long time. And it's still going on. This is, a, a, again, was done in 1977, and it's still going on. That's more than 30 years later, you know, and, um, and it's, it's a great program. And now uh, this, the, the, the National Parks has a design office, so I designed the, the entire system and gave it to them and make some, uh, some prototypes, some examples. Some of these things have been designed by me at the time. And uh, we designed five different levels of cartography because the, the usual cartography was pretty bad, etc., etc. But then the, the office took over and I was just going there, you know, at the beginning every month and then every two, three months and then every, twice a year, <laughs> you know, and so on to check, do more of this, do less of that, this is good, this is bad, da 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 da, da the whole thing, you know. And, uh, but this is exactly what I like, as I mentioned before, is really to create a language that other people can follow, you know, and that is what I'm interested in, in design, personally. Um, because I think that is design, you know, it's, it, it, design is not art, in my mind. Art is not design. You know, there are two different things. Not only that, but the more design goes toward art, and the least is design. And the more the art goes toward design, the least is art. So that's the way I see it. Um, they're both great, you know, but leave them alone. <laughs> uh, more publication for the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in, in New York. Newspaper, tabloids, posters, books, you know, and magazines, opposition, a very famous magazine, architectural magazine. There is a, an example. Um, it's a table that Leila designed with the big legs, you know, and a, and a big top, and it just sits on the, on the legs. There's no other structure. This is another table done by Leila that opens up and it doubles. You know, so when you have more friends, you, the table becomes big. Another chair that Leila did with a tubular uh, frame and foam and a socks that goes up, it goes on top of it. This is a table I have done for a, for a, a friend in a, that had a company, and he, asked, he came and he says, can you, 
I have, he said, I have access to little pieces of marble. Can you do something? And I said, sure, how about that? <laughs> you know, he made a sphere and a pyramid and a, in a cube. You can't go wrong. It's been done for 2,000 years, you know, or more. And a uh, piece of glass on top. And then, then he goes, uh, then he calls the week later and he says, you know, it's, it's very nice, that table. I said, yeah, yeah, I believe it. It's nice. It can't go wrong, you know. And then he said, you know, by the way, um, they're going to put it on the cover of uh, Vogue, Casa Vogue magazine. Oh, that's great. But that is the way it works in Italy. You know, you do it, and after a week is done, they take a picture, they put it on the magazine, and that's it. If you can't find it anymore thereafter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're very bad with distribution. Anyhow, the, the thing which interests from our point of view is to design things where the user can participate and can move things around, but the object doesn't lose its own identity. So we like to play all the time in every field of design that we work on this, on this game between identity and diversity. And the two things together, we think they're quite exciting when played. Books, I love to do books, and naturally, hundreds and hundreds of books of all kinds, informative books, you know, like guides or uh, books of photography books, flatware, again, I will go faster, and glassware, <coughs> again, we like to bring the, the glitter, you know, the vibration of the light, because as I said before, we, when the light finds something to be trapped, you know, it's very happy, but at the same time, it can also go through because the glass is transparent, it's not opaque. Uh, a mug, it doesn't have a hole, <laughs> this is, you know, in the picture. And plates, you see, in plates, you know, we set the table all the time, let me see the time. Yeah, I can tell you the story. <laughs> The, we, we, we set the table at the beginning of the, of the dinner, that we have candles, everything is nice and clean. And then uh, while we eat, the whole thing becomes like a trash can, you know, like garbage. You know, and at the end of the, the meal, you have to go on the plate and, and lift the fork and there are the bones left by the chicken, you know, and so on and so forth. All that stuffy uh, things, you know, leftovers. To, you put the dishes in the can because the bones are underneath. You know, that operation, then you have to go. I mean, really. So why don't we start from there, I say. So here, what you do, you eat, and at the end of your meal, you throw your flatware inside, you put the plates one on top of the other, ta -ta -ta, then you take one of these plates, you put it there on top. What you do, you, put, you make a, a clean pile of dirty dishes. That is design, you see. <laughs> Uh, you, we're getting older, a little, but very little, at, at the Aspen Conference. Um, this, uh, this is graphics for the uh, uh, International Design Center in New York. A lot of things for Fratelli Rossetti, uh, you know, a shoe company for IBM. Instead of doing plastic binder, because of our experience with books, we did a linen covers. <coughs> packaging, books, book for Noel, uh, more magazine, an architectural magazine, and books for all my friends, architects. I've designed all Richard Meyer's books and continuously until yesterday. And a book on, on cats and dogs. I love this because, you know, the poor cats and dogs, they, they've always been photographs like porn stars, you know, <laughs> against the blue velvet, <laughs> red velvet. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, poor animals, no decency. So I want to photograph them from the ground, you know, against the white background, like, like, a, like a fashion model, like our friend showed this morning, you know. And um, so here you see these cats against the, look how beautiful they are. Look at these dogs. Look how scientific is these things and <laughs> with all the reference, you know, and so forth. So that's, that's why I like to do guides. Um, this is an announcement for an exhibition of our work. And, and uh, so I did it on tissue paper with all the type, you know, set in Bodoni, all 
central, you know, very lapidary, very, very monumental. But then I took the whole thing and I crumpled so that all the type gets distorted and put on an envelope and send it around to all the friends. I thought it was going to be quite clear. <coughs> Two days later, I begin to get phone calls from my friends. I got an invitation from your, for your exhibit. It looks great. However, I don't know why I got it all crumpled up. <laughs> Do you have a flat one? <laughs> Can't win. <laughs> again, an ex a showroom for a furniture manufacturer. And again, you see the sphere, the pyramid, and the cylinder. The elements that keeps coming back in our language because they are timeless elements. Another showroom for a, for a, a furniture manufacturer that makes walls. So we create a lot of corridors, you can see there. And uh, then we ask Dan Flavin, one of your great, great national artists, you know, to do um, you know, light installations in the place. And it became fantastic because of Dan Flavin, but, um, I mean, and working together on, on that concept. Uh, another showroom for Artemide, another again, and another, the same uh, structure in, in Miami becomes all colorful, you know, with a different family of lamps up. Um, a friend of mine asked a lot of uh, postmodern uh, architects to design a tea set, you know. And of course, we are everything but postmodern. We always hated postmodernism. <laughs> Postmodernism in our mind was the 15 minutes of celebrity for people that never came before. They never understood what modern movement was, you know. And, uh, and so uh, postmodernism was using a lot of allegories and metaphors. And so we designed this tea set showing the snake of postmodernism, <laughs> you know, in going through the purity of the Euclidean geometry, so killing the sphere you know, eroding the corner of the cubes and so on. And you do a metaphor. This, <laughs> this is a table done by, um, again, by us, uh, with the, uh, here I like to show you the interaction between what we do in one field and the other. We, I call this the Bodoni table, because Bodoni type has, a, you know, big, take vertical strokes and very thin, you know, serifs. So here you have the series very thin and the vertical stroke very bold, you know. Again, I think there is this continuous cross-fertilization cross between one experience and the other. It's not true that if you're a, a graphic designer, you cannot design furniture. You could design it. You, you could. Design is one. You can do it. A table, again, and another table where you can change all these, the position of those elements without uh, losing the table identity. So I, I like that flexibility. I like that playfulness. Stacking chair. I love to do stacking chairs. I love to do stacking things. I think I like to stack everything. <laughs> 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 uh, this is a, a, co a corporate identity for a company. It's based on yellow, so everything is yellow. 85, 90, we're getting very established. We get an office, a much larger office. At the time, you know, 45 people and so on. You know, beautiful big office. And this is the studio area and so on. Um, this is for a construction fence for a, for a building. They, they were afraid that they would destroy the townhouses, so we confirm that they will be kept. Showroom for uh, Artemide again, another showroom for Artemide, another one for uh, Poltrona Frau. We, instead of filling up the space with chairs, we, we just put those uh, stele, in, stele in steel um, with pictures of different installations. A showroom again for Poltrona Frau. Before you get into that, then you go through a cube with a fountain and no, and no roof, so perfect. Uh, so you see all the, the clouds going by. And, um, and then you go into this long uh, space where uh, the old chair, the crappy chairs in the front and then new products on the back and a, and a, and a auditorium on the side. 
another chair designed for the Italian television, made again by Poltrona Frau, very successful. God, they sold thousands and thousands of these chairs. And uh, office furniture, again, designed for Frau, and again, and all these things, like naturally is involved, I said. A chair with four legs, very strange animal, and no more chairs with <laughs> almost. And again, another example where decoration is uh, achieved by subtraction instead of uh, adding things on the china glasses, which are all the same height but different diameter instead of being all cacophony of, of forms. Basic flatware, can't go wrong. Um, you know, tea, tea set, I mean a coffee set done by utilizing an existing part, which is this part here, and by adding the spout and these things and the dome and the bowl, you know, th just little elements like that, you know. Books, you know, for my friends, architectural books and, and uh, guides and a typeface. We redesigned Bodoni. I mean, people ask us to design type, but we think there are too many typefaces to begin. So we just redesigned Bodoni so that it can go well with Helvetica with the same proportion so that we can put the two type, you know, one next to the other without having to change the X height. Um, then, uh, as you see, um, we're getting a little older, but not that much, <laughs> and uh, more uh, things. Around that time, I was asked to design an exhibition of, of uh, our work, and so we choose the subject of uh, typefaces, and we, s we, we say that in the new computer age, the proliferation of typefaces and type manipulations represents a new level of visual pollution threatening our culture. Out of thousands of typefaces, all we need are a few basic ones and trash the rest. <laughs> so come and see a few basi basic typefaces. Now, this was done at the time that the computer came about, and every person that it was uh, your cousin uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on the computer and do, you know, desktop publishing using, you know, ugly type because you didn't have any knowledge of type and because the computer you can squeeze and compress type, you know, they were doing all this accordion work to typefaces and all of a sudden, you know, we had the proliferation of monsters. Um, you know, not only that, but everybody that could design a type all of a sudden it had, it wasn't like before when with lead, you had to, you know, really to know how to do the job properly. Now everybody could do type with a computer, and uh, with the, re the end result was that um, with the computer brought us the possibility of having the most beautiful, beautiful typography ever, but at the same time also the worst ever uh, because of these problems. So we, we were showing in, the, in that exhibit um, you know, how many things you can do with just four different typefaces. Then this is another corporate identity for a, a Salone del Mobile in Milan, <coughs> all done with, with Bodoni type, just to show that, you know, uh, what you can do even by using typefaces which are hundreds of years old. Um, naturally, uh, wine label, books, books, and again, I was talking before about scale and size. You see, when you change the scale, it becomes very emotional, becomes very effective. If, if, if this, instead of being on a page, becomes on two pages, it becomes very emotional. You're, you're not, we are playing with scale. With scale is, a, you know, as I say, is an intangible fact. Uh, more graphics for the American Institute in Paris for the Guggenheim Museum, for showroom, uh, for Poltrona Frau, based on, on few materials, steel and stone, and again our furniture there, and another one uh, for a steel case, and, and uh, then you can take the, the showroom home on a brochure, so to speak. And then clothing, um, just a second. We decided to do some clothing design, but I, I go faster. <laughs> and uh, 
uh, watches, with a um, lot of watches, uh, and this is a tisanier, you know, with a cast aluminum and silver, polished silver, and uh, necklaces done by Leila, and this turns around, you can do all kinds of things, so in the morning you can put it around your neck, and then in the afternoon you can have it here, then in the evening you can go down there. <laughs> it's nice, huh? <laughs> Leave it to Leila. <laughs> um, um, bracelets and rings, and uh, then we're getting older and older, and then we did the corporate identity for Benetton, by bringing some order in the whole thing, and Sisley, and for the Club 21, that is a famous restaurant in New York, for the World Trade Center in, in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, Leila did all the interiors, and this is one picture of, uh, I mean, you know, she created a canal, and then asked Chi Huli to do the balls there, the glass balls. For, with Frank Gehry, we did the graphics for, uh, for the Guggenheim Museum in, in Bilbao. And all, all the graphics for all the things. And we designed the chairs for the auditorium. And uh, Poltrona Frau has been making those chairs. And Leila will show tomorrow when, on her lecture, there will be more details about these things and a chair, again, for Patrona Frau, for, uh, for uh, airport seating, uh, a Ducati corporate identity. <coughs> it was fun to do. The, you, you might be familiar with the, this is a boat that goes between Ireland and, and Britain, and it's a ferry boat. We designed all the livery for that thing, and the livery for the Great Northeastern Railways uh, in England, and again, uh, it's all dark blue with a black stripe, uh, with a red stripe uh, throughout. And um, uh, there is, very traditional in a sense, but uh, very English. And, uh, and we designed all the interior, Lela did all the interiors of the train, uh, tourist, and then bus stops for, for JC Deco. And, uh, and there, um, railway signage for the Italian railways. You see all the thing. It's such a great thing when I go to Italy and take a train and it goes to from one little station to the other one and I see all this signage. It's so good for my ego, can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and museum signage the, the for the, for the, uh, the Houston Museum. Uh, donor signage are like, uh, donor's names are this big, but in Texas, this is like six point type, you know, for, for, uh, for the other places. This, these stones are uh, uh, three meters high, you know, the, the name of the museum. Silver, tac tac. <laughs> books, books. I go faster because the time is running over, Leila. More things from Leila's side. And this is packaging for a Polish pasta, very good. <laughs> Wines, a lot of Italian wine labels. And again, for the, an exhibition of, uh, uh, this is an exhibition of uh, jewelry. And showrooms for Poltrona Frau. Leila will have a more of that in her program, so I go faster um, on that side in different cities and different co context and with the vocabulary of materials. Uh, Leila will go through that. And uh, an, an exhibition of uh, uh, cars. And we, now we are beginning to get old. <laughs> uh, no more of that fancy stuff, you know, too bad. <laughs> and more silver things, books uh, and for a developer. Uh, in Miami, magazine, architecture, another architectural magazine for the uh, Dominican Republic. More wine labels, wine labels, a chair, that boom, in one, in one shot, you know, all plastic chair. And the same table that we have seen before, but done completely different materials. And all of a sudden, it becomes very much like today. And books, again, books of Meyer, 
more books for Meyer, more books for Meyer. <laughs> There's another book for the MoMA. And this is a book uh, on design is one on this subject. And this is another book on different uh, design issues. Uh, Zvignelli from A to Z. Um, I suggest you read it if you find it. And uh, what you can do, you can definitely download this from the internet. If you go on the internet, you look for Vignelli. Uh, Vin uh, yeah, look for Massimo Vignelli. <laughs> you open the page and you see Vignelli Canon. Oh, and you can download that or you can read it uh, right there. And, uh, you know, in two months, got 300,000 clicks, you know. That beats any kind of publication that I know. You know. Publishing is dead, I mean, in my, from my mind. The computer really is gonna be, internet is the next thing. The, the books are gonna change completely. As a matter of fact, next, uh, next June, uh, there will be a conference in the States um, on that subject. That is gonna be very interesting, the future of books. These are more wine labels and related things, another company, and a furniture company. We design the furniture and all the graphics, a pharmaceutical company in, uh, in Turkey, and a bank in, uh, in Santiago, Chile, and an insurance company as well, and a furniture, uh, sculpture furniture. And this is the new map that we have designed for the uh, New York subway, and, um, and, and that is the, um, the look. It's the same concept of the, uh, the, the one we designed before, but it's up to date in terms of all details of lines and nomenclature and stations, etc. And this is the very last thing that we have, have done, uh, just open few weeks ago is a restaurant. When you come to New York, you can go. It's called SD26. And this, this is a mural by Sheila Higgs. This is the big uh, main room. The, then there are a lot of little separate rooms and the bar. And, and that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.